me and I'm an engineer and I build things. Uh, CIO is just a fancy designation which I have. Uh, <clears throat> uh, Economic Times approached me and um, they asked me to talk on the topic of uncertainty and does it really create uh, opportunities. And when you think about uncertainty, fundamentally, uh, you think about wars, you think about battles, you think about chaos, uh, you think about uh, nasty stuff mostly. Uh, but then you read history, and then you read history a little bit deeply, and suddenly you find examples, examples of humanity, examples of humanity of, of extreme level, which are far more impactful, which are far more relevant, and suddenly you find inventions, and suddenly you find discoveries, and suddenly you see bravery in those. Now, I'm not in that particular league. What I have done, and I have 15 minutes, we are running late, I'm, I'm going to complete this whole, whole thing in 10 minutes. I'm going to uh, share five stories in 10 minutes. All those five stories, this is, all those five stories are built on actual patents. Three of those patents have been converted into products and platforms, and two of them, I'm actually working on them. So last two, I'm working on those patents. My first thing is when I travel across the world, I mostly travel in rural areas. And almost everywhere in India, or in Burma, or in Bhutan, or in Bangladesh, or villages in South America, when I visit, and I visit classrooms, I see two scenarios, and only two scenarios. One, where there is a teacher in center, and teacher is surrounded by students, and those students have no clue what that teacher is talking about, and teacher has no clue how to control those students. Ratio of teacher to students is humongous. And other scenario is where teacher is trying to do something, but their group of students, and these group of students are doing something among themselves. Some of them are talking, some of them are jumping, some of them are reading, some of them are trying to find out. But one thing is common, when you talk to these students personally, one thing is common, they have tons of questions. And they will not even wait for you to give answers. And suddenly you feel sad. You feel sad because they will ask you questions after questions after questions after questions and don't expect answers. Because during their educational journey, they don't know whether their questions are supposed to be answered. So while I was building robots with different, different kinds of robots with different students, my passion is to simplify robotic engineering. And some of these students actually came to me and they said that, look, we have creativity, we have questions, we just need a companion teacher which can convert those questions into answers and then we can actually drive curiosity into a machine, and then robot can actually drive learning into us. And I thought, this is a classical case of machine learning. Then I wrote a paper, and this is currently under experimentation in 19 schools. This is an actual robot. Uh, in most schools, it's actually giving a view of curriculum or data on a screen. But the idea is that can I teach this particular robot how to write, how to be relevant in terms of drawing, how to, how to be relevant in terms of answering simple questions and correlate so that a uniform language operates between man and machine. Totally an uncertain zone. Anyone who is from a village and passionate about village and education among rural kids. This chaos can be totally translated into a teacher which is actually created by students. Something to think about. My second story, and this, 
people who have heard me before, I, 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 just, I just talk about this story all the time till, till I, I personally solve this particular problem across, across India and, and across certain other countries where crime against women and children are huge. I fundamentally feel that most of us have high degree of consciousness. I also feel that most of us are actually cowards. We have high degree of consciousness and we are cowards. And there is a reason behind it. We are very busy, we have families, and the gap between us and law enforcement, gap between us and civic services, gap between us and citizen rights and operators of citizen rights is increasing. Now, can we create something which can bridge this particular gap? Can we combine social, which everyone uses, connect that social with everyone likes to talk about sensors and IOTs and all that stuff, so that we can stop, prevent things before they actually happen, and then connect with AI so that we can find out predictability of a crime or a theft or an incident or sometimes as bad as Nirbhaya so that it never happens. Most of these things which we see and which we hear and which we read and which we repent and we feel the sense of cowardice happen. Can we prevent them? Can we prevent them using tech? Now, a platform is there. Few courageous countries, they are very, very small countries, have adopted that platform. Hopefully, one day, few states in this country also, they will adapt it. But more than that, you, all of you are so important, and you run portfolios and huge portfolios of IT, and you have a considerable population of female, and you have considerable population of vendors or suppliers, and they have their families, if you can create your own networks on a similar principle or a similar platform, you can actually do something remarkable. So that's my second story. My third one is whenever we fail, and I have failed several times when I was building a compact SATCOM system so that problem of airports talking to an aircraft can be resolved in an amicable way, and especially in those terrains where you don't find a legitimate business case to invest, or carrying these huge satellites or dishes or SATCOM or you know, even finding a network equipment is not even feasible. And I failed again and again and again, and you suddenly get into this deep zone of depression and uncertainty till you find a person. And in this particular case, I actually find a, a young panchayat head. And he basically said, the Ravi, can you basically give, me, give this to me, to my village? And I asked him why. And he took me to few places in Ladakh. And he showed me that even though electricity was there, there was no internet. Connectivity, connectivity was on the mercy of defense services. And it was kind of living in a dark age. And I thought that people who live in cities who think that KB per second is no more applicable to them, if, if I can reduce the cost of the SATCOM and make it simple so that it can, be, it can be taken by road or in a parcel of almost this much of size rather than you know, having something which doesn't even fit in a normal aircraft, I can actually solve this particular problem. Today, roughly 67, exactly 67 villages use this in India and 184 villages across the globe. It just costs you roughly about 1.2 lakh rupees. So a failure in one domain can be a huge asset, a huge, huge asset for some other domain. So again, my request that 
you guys run tons of experiments, and if your experimentations are failing, I'm not asking you to basically invest somewhere else. If your experimentation has failed, at least invest that particular failure. Give that failure to someone else, to some other domain, and trust me, it has a utility. As an engineer, I'm saying that every tech investment has a utility. It never fails. We think it has failed for us, but it has its own application, it has its own use cases. So that's my third one. My fourth one is a little bit controversial one. I have challenged definition of democracy from the perspective of why majority is, a, is an answer for everything. When most logical decision making, most inventions, most transformation has actually happened through minority thinking. So why majority is such a big deal? And especially why majority is such a big deal when we have tech like blockchain or we have tech like distributed computing and we can give a citizen space, a citizen computing space to every citizen and let everyone's view should be there. And then with tons of computing processing what we have and capability we have today, we can find out even one minority voice. At least that should be heard, that should be understood, and that should have a opinion-based or a debate-based answer. There's a paper written to it. I have been to different government. Two governments have adopted it, again, very small countries. Most, most governments really appreciate that, but then it actually goes back as a nice paper. So I'm struggling with that. Platform is ready. It's on open source. The fifth one is something which I'm building. And I actually got a thrashing when I was giving similar kind of a talk in Europe. And a 16, I think 16 year old developer, he was blind. And he actually came to me and he said that whatever you do and whatever I've, I've, I've read a few of your papers, they're basically for majority of demography. I'm giving you an example of one of the oldest invention, successful invention, which is a blind stick. And it hasn't changed much. And I am a superior species to you, Ravi, because even though I don't have sight, my power to sense, my power to understand my power to behave and behave correctly when there is a constraint, if you switch off all the lights, is far more superior to you. My only disadvantage is that sometimes reluctantly I have to accept help. Now this happened about eight months back. And since then, actually, when I was coming to this particular flight, I actually noticed about 80-year-old gentleman being supported um, by, I think, his uh, better half, uh, carrying a stick and moving, into, moving through the aisles of an aircraft, and somebody touched the elbow of that gentleman, and he immediately reacted, hey, don't touch me, I don't need any help. I'm trying to solve it, and I'm trying to solve it in two ways. Paper is under patent, it's not yet patented by creating maps for blind. That means every blind, and there are about 8 million blinds across the world. Every blind should contribute that how to pass through obstacles. Sensors without stick, whether they are through ultrasound or whether they are through infrared, they should help so that emblem of blind moves away. I'm building it, and I'm building it with 17 students. Me and some of, our, some of us, we actually went to New Delhi Railway Station. We took a metro. We were not able to even find, trace the conveyor belt, the conveyor to cross two roads, to climb the stairs, to find the right railways. 
to find the right coach, it's a terrible thing. I can't change that part of uncertainty, but I can collect blinds together and I can combine multiple technologies to at least take away this emblem of blindness which was created in a pre-World War I or II era. So uncertainty has to go away. And I want to just close this with this. Usually in a corporate world, whenever we get into a zone of uncertainty, two things happen most often than not. One, we start doing this corporate politics and blame game. We just want to because we associate uncertainty with trouble. Or we try to create jugaad. We write books on jugaad. I think time has come that we should solve these problems, we should create products, and we should create platforms. And that's the only request which I have. You guys are extremely important people, and that's the only message I can give. Thank you very much.